Uh, so yeah, so I'm gonna be talking about uh, the crux mirror tool, which is a symbolic uh, execution tool for Rust code. Uh, and specifically, I'm gonna get into some of the more advanced features that we've been adding recently. Um, we're doing compositional verification uh, to help uh, help the tool scale to larger and more complex proofs. Uh, so just this kind of quick, uh, I'm gonna start with kind of what is crux mirror just in general uh, and how does it work? What can we do with it? And then get into kind of the more advanced features. Um, so just in general, the goals of the tool are to make it easy to apply symbolic uh, verification to Rust code, um, but also provide some advanced features for more complex cases um, where the code is bigger or maybe the, the reasoning that you're doing is a little more complex. Uh, so just as an example of kind of roughly what this looks like, uh, hopefully this will look somewhat familiar. Um, I think a lot of other tools do similar things. Uh, so if you want to write a kind of ordinary concrete test in Rust, you maybe sort of set up some input values, pass it to your function, assert that the function has returned a result that has the appropriate property. And you can run this with cargo test, and it will check that on this input, your function does the correct thing. Uh, so with crux mirror, you can write a symbolic version of this test where your inputs are replaced with symbolic variables. Uh, you can set some assumptions that kind of constrain those variables. And then you call your function as normal and make an assertion as normal. And now when you run this test through cargo crux test, it will actually check that the function uh, returns the, the kind of desired result on all possible combinations of those symbolic variables subject to the constraints that you set. Um, so in terms of kind of uh, the language and library features that Cruxmere supports, uh, it can handle uh, most of the standard kind of safe language features. Uh, so generics, traits, closures, trait objects, those all basically work fine. Uh, on the library side, it can handle uh, kind of a lot of the common kind of really essential types in Rust, such as vec, slice, uh, you know, box, cell, and so on. Uh, and it has this cargo crux test command, which is designed to provide kind of a familiar user interface. So if you're, so everyone's used to writing tests and running them with crux test, or sorry, with cargo test. Uh, and the idea here is that you should be able to write your symbolic tests roughly the same way and run them with a, a similar command. Uh, on the symbolic reasoning side, uh, you can create symbolic variables. You can set assumptions over those variables uh, to constrain the values that the test will kind of look at. Uh, and there are bindings that let you uh, have access to the SMT arrays and bit vectors of the underlying solver, uh, which can make some proofs more efficient. And finally, the uh, advanced features, uh, we have an FFI for calling Cryptol, which is a specification language for cryptographic algorithms. And this is really useful for kind of directly asserting that the output of your Rust implementation of some algorithm is identical to the output of the Cryptol spec. Uh, and we have compositional reasoning, where you can prove that a property holds of some function in your library, and then use the fact that that property holds when reasoning about other functions uh, that are callers of that, that first function uh, in hopes of kind of making breaking the proof down into pieces where each piece can be handled more efficiently. Uh, Right, so that was that was like a very basic overview of uh, the functionality of Crux. Uh, so next, I'm going to get in, into kind of uh, into more detail on an actual example, um, so you can maybe get a better idea of uh, how the tool works. Uh, I'm going to talk about the design and the language library support, uh, kind of how did we interface with the Rust compiler and that sort of thing, uh, and then get into these more advanced features uh, with the Cryptol FFI and compositional reasoning. All right, so uh, the main use cases that we're looking at. Uh, with uh, Crux Mirror and with Crux in general, uh, is programs that have uh, bounded code and bounded data, right? So they they run for a bounded amount of time, right? All of your loops have some finite bound that the solver can easily discover, and they are working with bounded data structures. And so this works really well for crypto implementations, where it's usually you know we are running exactly n rounds of this algorithm, and our block size is exactly x number of bytes. Um, we've also had some luck using this for verifying that serialization and deserialization code. Uh, has been written correctly. So if you have some custom code for serializing to some custom format, you maybe want to know that if you serialize some object and deserialize the object and deserialize the resulting bytes, you will get back an object that is equivalent to the original. Uh, so here is kind of a, a concrete example. Uh, this is a kind of bit of code out of the curve 25519 Dalek library. And what we're specifically looking at here is some kind of efficient representation of integers modulo some large prime number L. And this is, uh, you know, this is a highly optimized representation with optimized uh, 
uh, kind of algorithms for all the addition and subtraction and multiplication and so on. And what we would like to know about this code is, uh, is this optimized implementation of add correct? Does it actually compute A plus B mod L like it claims to? Um, so here's how we would go about testing that with Cruxmir. We want to create symbolic inputs, uh, right, for the, the arguments A and B. Uh, we want to compute their sum according to the scalar52 add function. And then we are going to compute the same function, but over uh, 256, bit, six, 256 bit bit vectors, um, kind of on the assumption that the solver's underlying bit vector type is uh, hopefully correct, or at least we trust that it's correct. And so what we are going to check is if we take the two symbolic inputs, or sorry, if we take the, the two scalar 52 inputs and their scalar 52 sum and convert them from the scalar 52 representation just to a 256 bit bit vector, uh, and assert that you know, uh, and assert that sort of this this add function has correctly computed a plus b mod l. Um, and this is the the same general structure that you'll see in uh, you know several of the other examples that I'm going to show, where you set up some symbolic inputs, call some function over those inputs, and then assert something about the result. Um, oh yeah, and if you uh, take this test and run Cargo Crux test, right? It will think about it for a while, right? It's building up some symbolic expression that it's going to send off to uh, Z3 or some other solver. Uh, and it's going to, uh, you know, chew on that for a while and eventually conclude that, you know, it couldn't find a counterexample. So this is valid on all possible values of A and B. Uh, I guess any questions on kind of the general, the general approach here before I get into some more details? I... I actually have a question. Um, mm -hmm. It's not so much with the example that you were showing here, but something I haven't been able to tell. Can you handle mutable references in Cruxmere, or is it just something that you haven't looked into because your target is more cryptographic code up until uh, now? We we can handle mutable references. Um, yes, I think our our handling for safe references is pretty robust. Uh, if you start trying to do funny things with unsafe raw pointers, uh, you can run into some cases that the tool doesn't handle. Um, but I think okay. basically all safe constructs work in Cruxmere at this point. So, so things like index mute and all of that kind of uh, like accessing collections mutably. Okay. Yeah, that works perfectly fine. Um, yeah, I think I'm, I'm trying to think of any of the examples that I'm I'm going to show later on do this. I think um, there's some code that uses slices, and is okay. uh, well. Now I'm trying to think if if indexing on slices actually goes through index mute or if it's uh, going through the mere constructs directly. Um, but we do handle index mute. Um, we've done stuff with like Vex and, and hash maps before. Um, okay. And that all works. All right. All right. Uh, yeah, so I'm going to talk a little, a little bit about the design and how we handle various language features, um, which will maybe give you a better idea of what exactly we do and, do, do and don't support. Um, so in terms of the general architecture, uh, the tool is set up in kind of two pieces. So the first piece is mere JSON, which is a Rust program that links against Rust-C as a library. It consumes your Rust source code. Um, actually, like I show only one file here, but uh, you know it will actually process all of the crates in your dependency graph when you run Cargo Crux test. Uh, and each crate that it processes, it outputs the mirror for that crate uh, in a custom JSON format. This custom JSON format is then consumed by kind of the backend piece, which is the actual Crux mirror binary. This is written in Haskell and links against the Crucible uh, symbolic execution library, and this will convert all of your uh, you know, mirror code into uh, crucible uh, ASTs and then run the crucible uh, symbolic execution engine, which will uh, do kind of usual symbolic execution things, right? It will build up this big formula or several big formulas, potentially depending on what you're doing, to send off to a solver. Based on what the solver says, it can either conclude that uh, your uh, uh, post conditions all hold on all inputs, or it will give you a counterexample, right? Some input where if you run this, the assertion will actually fail. Uh, all right, so just a quick word about what is Crucible. Uh, so Crucible is a strongly typed imperative language designed for symbolic execution. So uh, it has kind of the normal uh, imperative control flow constructs, but the primitive types are the types that you would see in SMT. Um, so Booleans, bit vectors, unbounded integers, SMT arrays, and so on. Uh, it has mechanisms for composing these into higher level types. Um, which is really convenient for things like uh, for, for tools such as Cruxmere, which are sort of mapping a high-level language down onto this. 
and it has support for mutable state. So you can have local variables that you can you can read and write uh, just like any other uh, imperative language. Uh, its symbolic execution strategy is uh, anytime it encounters a branch that where the branch condition depends on some symbolic variable, uh, it will split into two separate kind of threads of execution, uh, one where the branch condition is true, one where the branch condition is false. Uh, it runs both of those until it gets to the uh, post dominator of that branch in the CFG, and then it merges the two uh, states together. Uh, so depending on kind of what you're doing in the on the two sides of that branch, you know, maybe one of them stores to a variable and the other one doesn't. And so at the end of the branch, after it's merged, it will say, oh, the value of this variable is, well, if the condition on that branch was true, then it's, you know, the value five. And if it's false, then it will be the value 10, something to that effect. Um, we do use the SMT solver to check the feasibility of each path on those branches. So if it comes to a branch, uh, it will query the solver to find out if it's even possible given what it knows so far that the that you know the true branch could be taken or the false branch could be taken. If only one branch can be taken, it will just only go down that one branch and then there's no merging to do later on, um, which keeps the, the symbolic expressions and the solver queries a little simpler. Um, one thing about this strategy is we don't uh, require manually written loop invariants. What we do instead is we just unroll the loop until the solver can prove that the uh, back edge is no longer taken. Um, this does mean, this, this is part of the bounded code and bounded data. This is the bounded code part, right? Your branches have to have some kind of, or sorry, your loops have to have some kind of termination condition that the solver can easily uh, reason about. And if it can't ever prove uh, that your loop will terminate, uh, it will keep unrolling the loop forever and you won't get any answers. Uh, all right. Uh, going on to the uh, memory model, how do we sort of map the Rust, how do we kind of map uh, the Rust memory model down to something that Crucible can handle? Uh, the way that we handle this is each local variable in the mirror and each heap allocation is a separate object and objects are strongly typed. So they're allocated with a specific type and they have that type forever. Um, if you have something like a pair of I32s, right, a tuple, uh, that will show up uh, in the Crucible code as a Crucible structure with two fields of type 32-bit uh, bit vector. Um, and similarly, if you have something more complex, like a VEC of U8, right, the VEC itself is a struct with three fields. The first one is a pointer, and the next two are uh, BB64s for the length and capacity. And then that pointer refers to a separate object, which is an array of U8s, or an array of BB8s in sort of crucible terminology. Um, one thing to note here is the object layouts are abstract. So the memory model does not contain any uh, description of how these values map down to individual bytes. So normally when you see diagrams like this, what you're, what you're supposed to think is, oh, uh, you know, these two BB32 boxes, what that really means is this is like an eight byte object and the first four bytes are interpreted this way and the next four bytes are interpreted that way. Um, but here there is no kind of lower level byte representation. If you have this pair of I32s, right, you have two symbolic expressions of type BB32 and there's kind of nothing lower level than that. Um, and this leads to, to some uh, you know, constraints on our handling of unsafe code, which I will get into later. Um, I guess the other thing to mention is, uh, since everything is strongly typed, instead of uh, having, or I guess since we, have, since we don't have these uh, byte level representations of objects, uh, instead of a reference being like the identity of an object and a byte offset within the object, uh, here that doesn't really make sense. And so instead we have a reference to a root object and some kind of path to a sub-element, such as a field or an array element. Um, yeah, I think that's about it for the memory model. The main thing is just that we don't have this underlying byte representation. Uh, and when I get to unsafe code, I'll talk about kind of what the implications of that are. All right, I guess uh, in terms of other language support, uh, our handling of generics is based on monomorphization. Uh, so we want to morphize everything, not just functions, but also types. Uh, so when we uh, run that first uh, mere JSON step that dumps out all the code as JSON, in that JSON representation, uh, if you have a generic struct that's instantiated several times, each one of those becomes an independent type um, that aren't really linked together in any way. Um, this is essentially the same as what a kind of real code generating backend would do, like the LVM backend would do. Um, 
right, yeah. Uh, so once mere JSON runs, the JSON output that comes out of it has no generics at all, right? All of the generic functions have been sort of monomorphized. All the generic types have been monomorphized. And there are no traits uh, with this little asterisk that we do actually output some information about uh, VTable layouts for traits that are involved in uh, trait objects. Uh, just a word about kind of how we handle trait objects. We, uh, again, do this sort of complete monomorphization thing, uh, which in this case results in having a separate VTable layout for each instance of a trait specialized on both the trait parameters and the associated types. So basically anything that you can write after, if you have uh, you know dying trait, uh, anything you can write on the trait side, uh, or like every distinct thing that you write on the trait side of that uh, turns into a separate VTable layout. Um, and then to handle casts, when you do something like cast something to uh, dying iterator, uh, we, in the JSON output, annotate that cast with information about which concrete VTable it should attach when it's building the trait object. Right. Um, so now on to uh, how we handle the standard library and unsafe code. Uh, so we have some support for unsafe code. And the main reason that we added that is actually to handle the standard library. So one way you can imagine handling something like VEC is to write custom implementations for all of the VEC methods that uh, kind of implement them in a way that your solver can or your uh, backend can understand. Um, what we tried to do instead, kind of as much as we reasonably could, is actually implement the lower level primitives instead, since there are fewer of those. And if you implement a few kind of low level pointer manipulation operations, you'll actually get a bunch of this higher level stuff, such as slice and vec, uh, completely for free. Um, and the big benefit here is uh, when we update to a new version of Rust, so we're pinned to a specific nightly, when we update to a new nightly, having fewer library changes and fewer kind of hooks into the library that are uh, you know, hard-coded in the tool, um, that the fewer of those we have, the less we have to change when we upgrade to a new version of the library. Um, that's sort of the motivation there. In terms of what we actually concretely support uh, in unsafe code is we can handle raw pointers um, since they're basically like references, but with no lifetimes. And we already ignore the lifetimes uh, in constructing the crucible code. We can handle pointer arithmetic within arrays only uh, since it turns out that's all you need for most of the VEC and slice stuff. Uh, we can handle integer to pointer casts uh, to create pointers that are not valid as references. We use this for uh, uh, box and vec, which will, uh, and slice, I believe, which will all uh, construct a dummy value for the pointer if there's no allocation, like if, if it has length of zero. Um, we can do uh, fat pointer to thin pointer casts. Uh, I think that's actually for slices only. I don't think we handle that for uh, trait objects at the moment. Uh, we can handle some uh, low level memory intrinsics like swap, uh, pointer read, uh, you know, replace, and so on. And we can handle unsafe cell, which is kind of the underlying primitive that uh, lets you write uh, ref cell, uh, regular cell, uh, and a few other things. Uh, in terms of things that we don't support, basically, uh, a lot of this comes down to not having that underlying byte representation, like I was talking about before. So unions and raw pointer casts are basically both ways of interpreting a sequence of bytes as some other type than its original type. And so we don't support that because our memory model has no notion of, uh, you know, what does it actually mean to cast, to uh, try and read a U32 out of a pointer to a bunch of U8s. Um, we transmute is kind of the same way, but we have implemented some special cases there for common things like, uh, like converting an integer to an array of bytes or back. Uh, and finally, we don't support pointer to integer casts at the moment. Um, so we don't have to deal with kind of coming up with a consistent view of memory on a flat address space. All right. Uh, next up, uh, cargo integration. So like I said, we have this cargo crux test command, which will process all of the dependencies and run the symbolic tests. This is based on cargo test and tries to provide kind of a familiar UI for developers. Uh, the main challenge here is there are some things that you need to, uh, that cargo will build and then run during build time. These are things like build.rs and proc macros. Uh, and now we have a problem, which is that the code that we want to analyze has to be built against our custom fork of the standard library, where some constructs have been replaced with things that are sort of 
more amenable to the solver. Whereas code that you actually want to execute has to be built against the standard version of the standard library. Um, we distinguish these two cases uh, with kind of a, an awful hack uh, using the dash dash target option. Uh, but I think Miri uh, and probably some other tools are using the same trick. So, uh, uh, you know, I'm not a big fan of this solution, but at least we're in good company. Um, let's see. I think that is it for uh, language and library support. Uh, so maybe I will pause there for a second and see if there's any questions before I go on. Can you hear me? I hear you, yes. Yeah, um, okay, sorry for the noise. Uh, I, I have a couple questions about, um, so like, uh, um, what, what are the, like you said that, that uh, the solver must be able to prove that, uh, that the code terminates, right? So that's like the main restriction on, on like, um, what kind of, what kinds of tests I can, I can write, right? Yes. Um, and, and so, so I'm thinking about, uh, there is, there is a similar problem to this, I think, uh, that uh i was trying to solve like a year ago but whatever like it's about like similar to this like symbolic execution on the compiler mm -hmm. and like to 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 enhance certain optimizations that the compiler currently cannot do and like uh i was wondering how feasible would it be to maybe to maybe integrate some of the machinery that you have built in like like I, I would help you with this like no worries i will do my best but like uh like in say three four years from now like after after like i don't know like uh ah i, I i'm sorry this is very hard to, to elaborate english on the fly um uh, well I, I can tell you what i think you're asking which is uh could we integrate some of this machinery into a compiler to give the compiler the information that it needs to enable some additional optimizations? Yes, more I or think... less. I think basically when I, this uh, unroll until proof to terminate business, I think uh, the reason that we're actually doing there is not all that sophisticated. Um, so I, I guess I'm not sure Oh no! Like like the the problem I was trying to solve basically has the same limitations. That's that's oh, okay. uh, like uh, like it, like some optimizations are actually like undesirable and stuff. So like you also have to to impose these kinds of restrictions. Like uh, uh, you basically choose to to cap to capture less information in exchange of basically being able to decide it if that makes sense i um i think so yeah um and so like like a uh, your your you know that your descriptions of the of the limitations of this remind reminded me a lot of the of what i learned on the way of building them so so yeah i, I think i think we basically have the same restrictions. So that's, that's a, uh, yeah. So the yeah. restrictions would be no problem. <laughs> yeah. I think I'm, I'm not sure I really have any kind of solutions or, or answers for this. Um, what we usually end up doing for code that uh, would potentially not terminate is uh, just uh, basically set assumptions that force the bound on the loop, uh, mm -hmm. the number of loop iterations. Um, and I think there's like, if you look at other tools like CBMC, I think there's a an option to tell it to only unroll loops up to a certain number of times. And that sort of limits the reasoning that you can do, but is, uh, I think I think it's it's much simpler than other approaches such as trying to like infer an appropriate loop invariant. Right, right. 
yeah but but that at least makes it a, a desirable which is already well i think more than anything we have right now so yeah but i i think when you when you set an artificial bound on the number of loop iterations like that uh you will get an answer uh but the answer might be well your program was going to run for too many iterations so i stopped looking um yeah so yeah, yeah yeah it might not give you like i showed the diagram where it either says like here you know you have successfully proved the post condition or it says here's a counter example and now we've introduced a third option which is uh your loop bound was too low so the solver was not able to determine definitively one way or the other right 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 basically basically a solver saying i cannot solve the halting problem so i will leave it at that and <laughs> yeah and we and we will accept our destiny i don't know yeah uh, maybe for optimization uh, that that's that's good enough right and if it says you know mm -hmm. this, this would run too many times then you say well i can't be sure this optimization is okay so i'll, I'll just have to pass on this one yeah 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 anything usually anything uh, is better than than the the optimum if if like the optimum is unreachable then why bother yeah absolutely mm -hmm. uh, uh uh, thank you so much uh, uh, for making this. And um, and now, sorry for taking up your time, but thank you for the answer as well. All right. Uh, so, go ahead. I'm sorry. If you have time for a, a, a couple very quick questions, uh, mm -hmm. I, or otherwise I can wait till the end. Uh, whatever you. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. Um. So I have. Uh, one one question was re regarding um, monomorphization, uh, and maybe you get to this in the last bit where you talk about uh, modular proofs. But uh, I guess does this mean that you effectively have to reprove the bodies of each func of each monomorphization of each generic function that you might be using, right? Like if you have um, some assertion in a generic function, then you have to check it for each instance of the the generic function, right? Yes. Uh, well, so so the way that this is structured, right, is like you have a single uh, non-generic test function at the top level. And as we right. execute through that, anytime we encounter an assertion, we will sort of check that the assertion holds. Right. It's possible that that assertion is in a generic function that is called multiple times with multiple sets of type parameters. Yeah. In which case, we will kind of uh, evaluate that assertion multiple times. OK. Yeah. Yeah, that was exactly my question. Um, and another very quick one, it's also related to loops, but it was uh, just, do you have any mechanism for users to provide loop invariants to say, okay, I know you won't be able to unroll this, but you know, here's this simple logical formula that is the invariant you need. We don't have any mechanism for that at the moment. Um, okay. There has been some work towards that in sort of the, the overall uh, Crux framework, uh, just to clarify, right? So Crux is like this kind of overarching framework um, where we have a an LLVM uh, verifier built on top of Crux um, for doing C, C++, and we have a mirror-based verifier built on top of Crux for doing Rust uh, verification. And I think over on the LLVM side, uh, some of the people who work on that have been looking at uh, what would be needed to add loop invariants, but I'm not sure what the status of that is. I don't think it's very far along yet. All right, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. All right, uh, anything else or should I go on to the, uh, the crypto all features? I think you're good. All right, uh, right. So uh, before I talk about crypto FFI, first, what is crypto? Uh, so crypto is a domain specific language for specifying cryptographic algorithms. The idea basically is you should be able to take a paper spec or LaTeX spec, such as the, the kind of top one here, where it's written in terms of basically math. You should be able to translate that more or less directly into actual code that you can execute and analyze. Um, that way you can kind of have high confidence that that translation is correct. And that the thing that you are, the specification that you are verifying everything against uh, really is the specification that you want. Um, so you can see here, like the translation from this, uh, you know, LaTeX version of f of f of t, or f sub t of uh, x, y, and z over to the Cryptol version, uh, sort of preserves the same structure uh, and the same operations uh, pretty closely. Uh, I guess one thing to mention here, because this is going to show up in a bunch of places, uh, this square bracket 
notation is how cryptol does arrays. And if there is no element type specified, it defaults to bit. So a square bracket 32 is an array of 32 bits, also known as uh, BB32. Uh, so the idea here is we have some cryptol versions of specifications for various cryptographic algorithms. We'd like to verify that Rust implementations of those algorithms match the behavior of the specification, right? So on the left, we have a uh, cryptol spec for ChaCha20. On the right, we have the ChaCha20 implementation from Rust Crypto. And what we want to know is, uh, are these two implementations actually equivalent to each other? So uh, in order to handle this inside of Cruxmere, the first thing that we need is a way to actually call cryptol functions from Rust. Uh, so what we have for that is this cryptol macro. Uh, and what you give this is first you give it the name of a uh, cryptol module to look at. Uh, and then you can define bindings that are uh, basically Rust functions that when you call them, instead of executing some Rust code, they execute some cryptol code. Similar to uh, FFI bindings like you would see in an extern block, except these ones actually have a definition on the right hand side. Uh, so the kind of two pieces uh, for each of these bindings is you have a Rust signature. Uh, in this case, for example, we have an array of uh, 16 32-bit words uh, going to an array of 64 bytes. And on the right-hand side, you have a cryptol expression, uh, which is just wrapped up as a string constant, since otherwise the syntax would, you know, the, the Rust compiler would not be happy looking at that syntax. Uh, and this cryptol expression uh, is evaluated in the context of the module above. Uh, it can be arbitrary cryptol expression, not just a, a single function name. Um, which is useful in some cases, uh, which I'll show later on. Uh, and it has to have a type that's compatible with the Rust signature that you've given. So in this case, uh, the expression core right, evaluates to the core function uh, from this cryptol module. Type of that function is uh, round to block, or if you expand the type aliases, it's an array of 16 32-bit words to an array of 64 bytes. This is exactly what the Rust signature says, and so this binding is valid. Um, when we write the test, uh, to kind of assert that these two implementations are equivalent. Uh, the structure here is, you know, we create some symbolic inputs. Uh, we call the Rust implementation. In this case, we, uh, you know, set up one of these core objects and call its generate method to, uh, to generate a block of output. Uh, then we call the cryptol spec. And you can see here, we're just calling uh, what look like ordinary Rust functions, but these are the ones defined above by this macro, where when you call them, uh, there are hooks inside of the Cruxmere tool that will, uh, instead of running the actual function, uh, run the cryptol expression on the right, uh, converting all of the arguments and return values back and forth between the Rust and cryptol representations. Um, so the result of this is you can uh, kind of feed in symbolic inputs, uh, like the ones that we created above. Uh, these will be converted to cryptol symbolic ex or symbolic expressions that the cryptol uh, symbolic evaluator can handle. It will run that to create some larger symbolic expression. Then we convert that symbolic expression back to the crucible uh, kind of style and can return that as a Rust value. Uh, and then finally, we can just sort of, with whatever normal Rust mechanisms, assert that the results are equal. Uh, I think this is running on an older version of Rust, which is why I don't just assert Rust output equals cryptol output, since it's more than 32 elements in the array. Uh, double equals used to not work on those. Um, Right, and we can uh, run cargo crux test, same as anything else. It will go build all the dependencies. It will run the symbolic execution. Uh, in this case, it includes calling into the cryptol symbolic evaluator for some of these operations. Uh, then it will build up its giant uh, uh, SMT query, feed it to Z3, and Z3 will think about it for a while and conclude that this is valid. Uh, this Rust implementation of ChaCha20 behaves identically to the cryptol implementation. Uh, in terms of kind of how this machinery works. Uh, inside of the Crucible framework, there's a notion of overrides where you can uh, install an override on some named function. And when you call that function, or when the, during symbolic execution, when it sees a call to that function, instead of actually running the code for that function, it will run the override, which can have kind of arbitrary behavior. Um, so uh, when we use that cryptol macro, all of the functions that you define under that macro are automatically overridden to convert all of their arguments to these cryptol values, run the cryptol symbolic evaluator, and convert the result back to a Rust value. Um, 
in terms of kind of the infrastructure that makes this feasible, uh, it turns out the Crucible and Cryptol uh, symbolic evaluators uh, are using some kind of common infrastructure. So you don't need to pay attention to all the names of all of these pieces here. Um, but I will say uh, sort of the main functionality of Cruxmere is to turn mirror code into Crucible code. But there are actually several layers below that. And at one of those lower layers, we can actually tie into uh, some of the representations used by the Cryptol symbolic evaluator. Uh, and so you know, if you kind of follow all of these arrows, you can see that there's a way to get from Cryptol to something that is compatible with uh, our Rust symbolic execution. And that's why we can kind of do these cross-language calls very easily. Um, I think that's it for the, the uh, Cryptol uh, FFI. Uh, and you'll see more of this in a minute when I get into compositional reasoning. Um, but if there's any questions on this so far, then I, I will pause here for a second. All right. Uh, on I, uh, maybe have one question. Oh, go ahead. <laughs> um, uh, when the software runs to prove the ChaCha20 spec, um, is that like seconds, minutes, hours, days? How, how long does it take? Yeah, I forget the exact amount of time, but it's it's uh, something like, uh, I think this one's like uh, maybe two minutes. Nice. Um, so ChaCha20 is, is a pretty simple algorithm. Uh, and so, uh, well, in a minute, I will get into uh, kind of why it's so quick, because we're about to see one that is not so quick, where we actually have to do some more work to get it to go through in a reasonable amount of time. Awesome. Thank you. All right, so I'm going to get into uh, compositional reasoning. Uh, so the main idea here is we have some function f. We're going to prove that it satisfies a spec. And then we're, when we are reasoning about g, just some other function that calls f, we're going to somehow use the spec instead of the actual body of the function f. And the purpose of this is if you write the spec properly, you can end up with your proof of g being kind of more efficient, right? The, the queries that it sends to the solver are easier for the solver to handle. Um, so here is an example of a place where we need this. Uh, right, so we just had this, this nice proof of ChaCha20, right? We showed that uh, the Rust implementation matches the spec. Uh, let's try to do the same thing for SHA-256. Uh, so I've got the ring uh, libraries implementation of SHA-256. Uh, I have bindings to the cryptol spec for SHA-256. Uh, this is like the, the block processing function so that like consumes a single block and updates the, the uh, accumulated state. Uh, and now we're going to write a uh, test case just like the one that we had before, where we create some symbolic inputs. We call the Rust version of this function. We call the Cryptol version of this function. We assert that the results are equal. If you try and run this, uh, you know you run Cargo Crux test, does all the builds, does the symbolic execution, sends things to the solver, but the solver will just kind of think about this forever and never come back. Okay, so. Why does SHA-256 time out when ChaCha20 didn't? Uh, the main reason, so there, there's kind of two reasons for this. One reason is just that SHA-256 is bigger and more complex. Um, the other reason is that the Rust and Cryptol versions of SHA-256 don't match as closely as the ChaCha20 version, or as, as the two versions did on ChaCha20. So since ChaCha20 is so simple, there's kind of like only really one way to go about writing it. And you know, it just so happens that the uh, developers of the Rust version and the developers of that Cryptol spec chose the same approach. And so it ended up performing basically all of the same operations in the same order and constructed nearly identical symbolic expressions to give to the solver. So Z3 had no trouble proving that those expressions were actually identical or actually equivalent, uh, despite not being syntactically identical. Um, on SHA-256, uh, there are a lot more places where this ring implementation and the Cryptol spec don't actually line up as well. Uh, so here's an example. This is some uh, uh, helper function. I forget what exactly this function is actually for, but it's buried somewhere in the middle of the, the SHA-256 implementation. And if you look at kind of the code on the left and the code on the right uh, in the boxes there, you can see that kind of the Rust version is doing this sigma-1 operation and then sigma-0. And the other one is doing sigma-0 and then sigma-1 and kind of adding them up in opposite orders. Um, and if you look at kind of to kind of summarize what's going on here, right, is that they've sort of done the same additions, but kind of nested them differently, roughly speaking. Uh, and the result of this is that uh, you end up with, after symbolic execution, you end up with SMT queries where these sub-expressions are not actually identical. Um, now, if you if you ask Z3, like here are here's my you know 
uh, Rust version of this Sigma business and the, the Cryptol version of this Sigma business, uh, and you ask it, are these two expressions equivalent? It will come back almost instantly and say, yes, right? These do the same thing on all inputs. Uh, but if you look at these in the context of the overall proof, right? These are going to be embedded as some like tiny sub-expression of some giant uh, AST. Uh, and when you send this giant expression to the solver, basically there are a bunch of interior uh, sub-expressions where the solver maybe could make progress by proving that this sub-expression on the left is equivalent to that sub-expression on the right. But sort of there's so many choices that the solver can't really figure out which one is going to be the most useful. Uh, and so it doesn't recognize or at least doesn't recognize easily that uh, it could prove these two little subtrees equivalent and make a lot of progress that way. So uh, what we're going to use compositional verification for here is to basically give the solver a hand. We're going to uh, modify the Rust version uh, to plug in the Cryptol version of this sub-expression. So anytime it would use this uh, helper function, it's instead going to use the, the Cryptol version so that these subtrees will be identical when this goes off to the solver. Uh, and then, uh, you know, as you say, that, that lets it do the proof. But actually, if you do this and then do the same thing in a bunch of other places, that's enough to, uh, to let the proof go through. Uh, so how do we actually go about this? So what we're going to do is we're going to prove that message schedule one is equivalent to its cryptol version. right? We prove that these two little subtrees are, are equivalent. Then we're going to use that spec in place of message schedule one when executing the higher level function uh, block data order. And what that's going to do is essentially replace the Rust version of this helper function with the Cryptol version in the context of this larger uh, uh, proof and produce a, uh, produce a couple of trees where the, the sub-expressions actually do match up and the solver can make progress more easily. Uh, so here's what that looks like. Uh, so on the left, we have the Rust version of message schedule one again. On the right, we have Cryptol bindings where in this case, the uh, kind of right-hand side of that, instead of being a cryptol function name, is a Lambda expression uh, in cryptol syntax. Uh, the signatures uh, are actually uh, equivalent uh, once you specialize the one on the left with the type wrapping of U32 as its uh, generic parameter. Uh, and so uh, you know, what we'd like to prove first is that uh, basically, the Rust version on the left and the Cryptol version on the right are indeed actually equivalent. Uh, so what that looks like is we have another one of these uh, tests, like the ones that we've seen before. You create some symbolic inputs. Uh, you can actually assume a precondition here. We don't need it, um, but I'm going to be pointing at this later. Um, you call the Rust version of the function, and then you assert that some property holds of the output. And in this case, the property that we're asserting is that the output from the Rust version is equivalent to the output from calling the uh, Cryptol version of this function. Now, uh, one thing to notice here is the uh, attribute on the top of this uh, message schedule one equiv test is not crux test. It's this crux spec for message schedule one. And so this crux spec for attribute uh, kind of has two meanings. The first meaning is kind of the same as crux test, right? Run symbolic execution, check that all these assertions uh, succeed on all inputs. Um, the other meaning of this is it, uh, causes the tool to generate a specification for or to generate uh, an alter a uh, an override implementation for message schedule one based on the structure of this test case. Um, so here's some kind of pseudocode. Uh, and this is we don't actually generate concrete rust code uh, for this override, but this is kind of a representation of what the tool is doing internally when this override is called. Uh, so to get into kind of the details here of how this override is put together, uh, first, it takes the same signature as the function that we're going to uh, replace with the override. Um, in this case, again, right, we had to specialize, uh, you know, message schedule one is generic. Uh, I think you can plug in either wrapping U32 if you want SHA-256, or you can plug in wrapping uh, U64, uh, which will give you a SHA-512 implementation instead. Uh, we're focused on SHA-256, so we uh, specialize this to wrapping U32. Um, then for actually constructing the body of this thing, uh, first, uh, the symbolic inputs uh, that were used in the test now, now are computed from the arguments that were passed to 
this message schedule one function. Uh, in this case, it's totally uh, trivial. Um, but if you're doing something more sophisticated, uh, potentially things involving uh, pointers, slices, and so on, uh, this can get a little more interesting. Uh, the precondition uh, has turned from an assumption that constrains the values used in the test into an assertion, uh, which essentially says that you can only use this override if the inputs are, uh, if the input values that you're providing are a set of values that were actually considered when running the test. Right, so you can imagine, right, if we had had a precondition that says like, oh, A has to be even, running the test tells you that for all even values of A, uh, you know, the post condition holds, but it doesn't tell you anything about odd values of A. And so we would, we would need an assertion on the right that A is even, because if A is not even, uh, then we actually know nothing about how this function behaves, or at least we, we didn't learn anything about how this function behaves from running that test. All right, so... Uh, now we get to the part where we call the function uh, to get the result. And on the right-hand side, what we're doing instead is uh, just creating a symbolic value. Say, you know, uh, we're not going, we don't want to run the function since the whole point of this override is to be a replacement for calling the function. Um, so what we do instead is we just create a new symbolic value and then constrain that symbolic value uh, with an assumption to say that basically it satisfies the post condition that was asserted in the test. Um, and so this is this is kind of like a, a pretty mechanical process, uh, and as a result, there are kind of constraints on what you can actually write on the in uh, the test. If you have sort of too complex uh, control flow or the inputs are uh, too complicated, uh, this process can fail. You'll get an error. You won't be able to. You won't get a usable override out of it. Um, but for straightforward things, you know, if you kind of write things in the straightforward manner, where you create the symbolic inputs, pass them directly to the function, and assert a post condition. Uh, this will generally succeed. Um, oh yeah, and just to kind of summarize that, if you look at kind of what we're doing on the right here in this override, uh, effectively what we've done is defined an override that just takes all the arguments and passes them to the cryptal version of message schedule one. Um, this is because the post condition constrains the output to have exactly the value that you get by running message schedule one, uh, the cryptal version. Uh, if you had a a uh, weaker post condition that just like asserts that the output is positive, that kind of thing, uh, then you would end up with something that is not simply a call to some other var variant of this function. Uh, but so uh, in terms of using the spec, uh, so I, I told you, right, that override that I showed was pseudocode, um, but the code that we actually do generate is a function that constructs uh, what we call a method spec object. Uh, and this method spec object is what allows you to kind of install the override and say that you know, for all, for all future calls to message schedule one in this test case, you should instead run that override from the previous slide. And so uh, what we do is in the, uh, in kind of this top level test over here on the right, uh, we call message schedule one equip spec. We enable the method spec that it gives back, which installs this override on the message schedule one function. And then we do the rest of the test as normal. But now when we go into, uh, this block data order function, the Rust implementation, anytime that calls message schedule one, we will instead run the cryptal version. Uh, and so as a result, we will end up with uh, you know, a uh, kind of version of the Rust uh, symbolic expression where some pieces have been substituted to match the cryptal version exactly. And since those sub-expressions match exactly, now when you give this to the solver, it will actually be able to finish in a reasonable amount of time. Um, I think this one takes like five or 10 minutes maybe uh, and conclude that this uh, you know, block processing function in Rust is actually equivalent to the crypto one. I have a quick question. Mm -hmm. um, wait, could, could you just quickly re recap what are the parts the user actually writes and what are the parts that are generated by the tool again? Right, so this, um, this uh, function at the bottom left of this slide, the message right. schedule one equiv test case, uh, is written by the user. This okay. is written, you know, written in kind of the same style as an ordinary uh, symbolic test. Uh, and then the one on the right is generated. Okay. And so, right, we have this this automated transformation, right, that will kind of go through these pieces and and kind of flip them around, right. All your assertions become assumptions. All your assumptions become assertions uh, to produce this this override. Is there uh, is there any reason why you don't 
do a more like um, contract based approach, like you annotate message message schedule one directly, maybe saying or may, maybe rather it would be like refinement, just say like, uh, I want this crypto function to be its spec or this crypto expression to be its spec and just generate everything from that. Um, yeah, I think we um, we could implement that. That would probably be uh, easier to use. Uh, I think this version is more flexible uh, for cases where you don't have. Uh, yeah, I guess for cases where you're not proving equivalence to like a specific function. Um, yeah, and what what we were kind of going for here is we have another tool that allows this style of reasoning. Uh, and we were trying to kind of uh, match as much of its flexibility as we could uh, in Cruxmere with like a slightly simpler UI. And so we have ended up with something that's kind of maybe uh, more flexible, but also more difficult to use than uh, the style that you described. Yeah. Uh, uh, if I can add something, I, I think the difference is, so I, I, mean, I mean, like the, the use case, the contract-based approach cannot, cannot do is when you have like, uh, different APIs than the spec, if that makes sense. So like, not really. So like, uh, like, uh, say, say the spec has uh, two variables, like um, your input and a constant that you use for, for like, seeding whatever like a, a hash map or something i don't know a, a, or a hash function um and you your library your implementation uh, fix this fixes the second argument like to a constant because you don't care like you only you don't need to to have the general implementation you just use i don't know 17 or whatever, like your favorite point number. And then your API would be different than the, than the API of the spec. Yeah, so I, that doesn't, that's not insurmountable in a contract based approach. I mean, yeah. you can, you could just have it be a function call in your contract and, you know, fix the constant at say, well, it implements this logical function with the second parameter fixed to 17 or whatever. Um, oh, but, oh, 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 I see, I see, I see. Okay. Oh, that's, Oh, that's okay. That's cool. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Um, sorry to interrupt you, Stuart. Um, I don't know how much more you have. Uh, if you want to finish, we can talk a little bit afterwards. I think I am. I think I am just about done here. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, if anyone has any other questions, I'm, I'm uh, happy to take them. Um, I have, I think this is short. I, I, I lost, like I missed, I sorry, uh, sorry, I missed the like first eight minutes of the presentation. Why, why is the library um, using nightly only? Uh, oh. I, 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 th I, I, I feel like the answer is like very obvious, but I. It's, yeah. so we're, we're pinned to a specific nightly because, uh, this mere JSON tool here um, is using Rust C internal APIs. Oh, uh, of course. Right. It, it, it's it's the same problem that I'm I'm sure half the people on this call have run into, right? Where you want to get the mirror out of the compiler, and the only way to do that is to hook into the compiler's unstable APIs. Yeah, 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 yeah. Absolutely. Okay, I see. I got a um, follow-up question from from earlier. Mm -hmm. Uh, so yeah, chapter 20 is about two minutes. The SHA-256, how long does that roughly take? Uh, sorry, the question is how long did the SHA-256 proof take to run? Exactly. Yeah, I, uh, it's, it's about five to 10 minutes. Um, oh, very nice. Yeah, uh, once you do the, once you break it down into, into pieces, like I was describing, um, yeah. right? If, if you try to just run it naively, it, it never comes back. Oh, I still find that very impressive. Nice work there. <laughs> Thanks for answering. So I have another quick question from a fellow implementer of a verification tool. You mentioned that uh, 
you guys have a fork of the standard library uh, that you've patched. Mm -hmm. um, how difficult do you find that to be in, in how difficult do you find the maintenance of that to be in practice? Um, if you could, I imagine you have to rebase relatively frequently to try and follow the nightlies. Um, we actually don't follow the nightlies very closely. Uh, now that we, we are currently on a nightly from 2020, I believe, which is quite a bit out of date. And we are only just now starting to actually run into problems with that. Um, so I guess, uh, yeah, I, I guess maybe the answer is actually you can, you can uh, handle quite a lot of code without kind of uh, tracking the nightlies, you know, week by week or something like that. Um, since people just don't adopt the new language features like the moment they come out, basically. Yeah. But um, are you not worried that you're gonna sort of get locked by just the divergence or you know get blocked uh, when you do try to update and find that everything breaks? Um, I think uh, so far the upgrades that we have done have not been that bad. Um, the reason is that the mirror representation and semantics don't change all that much between like they're they're unstable and you know occasionally the compiler developers will go in and refactor something and rename a bunch of things and you have to figure out you know where did where did this module get moved to and so on um, but in terms of the semantics uh, not much changes um, the JSON the custom JSON format that we've using that we've been using uh, has actually been really helpful for this because we can just output the same JSON format even if something has changed internally in the mirror representation. Um, the library changes. Um, I think our our total library patches are down to like a thousand or fifteen hundred lines of code or like lines of diff, right? Um, so they're not they're not tremendous. Um, and so I think it historically has not been a huge problem to try and migrate those e even across like, you know, six months or a year worth of, of Rust compiler changes. Okay. Um, uh, incidentally, I don't know if you've, uh, if you've heard of the stable mirror project. Uh, I'm, I'm sort of vaguely aware people have been talking about this for a while. I'm not sure. Is it, is it making significant progress these days? Uh, well, it's, it's sort of starting off, but um, I think there's significant energy, yeah. So um, your mirror JSON stuff it seems like it would mean you would be able to bring a lot to the table and experience on uh, trying to abstract away from internal details of uh, mirror. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I guess. Uh, do you know where I can find that if I Google? Oh yeah, it's on. A, it's on. It's on the Rustling Zulip, and okay, there's great. a there's a repo on the Rust organization as well. Um, Great. Yeah. yeah, I will definitely check that out. Yeah, I hope to see you there. <laughs> um, yeah, are there any further questions for Stuart? Um, I I am not sure how to formulate this question, but like I've been I've been following like the the recent say two to three years conversation around um, the like the LLVM mailing lists uh, about certain transforms, particularly optimizations that are like um, sound individually, but that do not compose um, like properly, like they break each other sometimes. And I don't know, like when, when you talked about the crypto uh, features which are like they, they look awesome like what, what the fuck that is so cool um um I, I was thinking like i wonder if, if there's a way to like write a like a spec of a program or or something like that and test if the if the compiler isn't breaking it when it optimizes it. Yeah, so like a like, like translation validation kind of thing, maybe? You, yeah, 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 yeah. Translation validation. I, I didn't know the name. That's exactly what I'm looking for. Yeah, so uh, 
actually, I mean, so one thing that we've been talking about uh, as like a possible uh, future, uh, like major feature for Crux is cross-language verification so that you can verify uh, like a Rust program that calls into C, for example. Um, if we had that functionality, since our C support is based actually entirely on LVM, right? We just like run Clang and then the actual symbolic execution tool consumes the LVM. Um, we could potentially try and do something like you described where we uh, sort of have, have Crux mirror uh, convert the mirror code uh, to Crucible, then also run Rust C on the same Rust code and take the LVM that comes out of Rust C and run that through Crux LVM. And now we have the version derived from mirror and the version derived from LVM, and we can assert that these are equal uh, and maybe find if there has been some kind of misoptimization like you're describing. Holy shit, that would be, oh my God. <laughs> that, that would not like solve everything that's like because there's some formal work that is that is in progress and like mm -hmm. uh, but like that would that would help so much to pinpoint uh, at least uh, at least to pinpoint where where or when there is a problem yeah, like that yeah yeah i feel like i, I don't know uh, kind of the limitation there is it's still kind of uh based on uh testing specific concrete inputs but in this case the inputs are programs Right, so you have a misoptimization that only fires if you do a particular weird combination of operations. Uh, this might not catch that if that's not in your test suite. Yeah, exactly, exactly. It is like an, a counterexample finder and not like a for all X. Uh, yeah, program. yeah, we don't yeah. we don't have any machinery that can reason about for all programs in this framework. Yeah, yeah, no, I mean that. Yeah, that would be, I think, impossible probably. I don't know, but. Yeah, like, yeah, that could, ah, thank you so much for making this <laughs> possible. I don't know. Uh, how, how did you say this uh, translation verification? Uh, translation what? validation. Uh, translation the, validation. It, it's sort of an uh, kind of alternative to, to formal compiler verification, right? So uh, if you're verifying a compiler, uh, in a theorem prover like Hawk or something like that. Um, one thing mm -hmm. that you can say is uh, like for all inputs, uh, you know, the output program that's been optimized behaves the same as the input program. Um, but the other thing that you can say is uh, just run the compiler and then uh, have some kind of uh, like verified checker uh, that looks at the two programs and checks that they're equivalent. And the downside of this is if your compiler has a bug, you might run the compiler and uh, the checker might say, actually, uh, you know, this thing has been miscompiled and, and throw out your program. Uh, and like, you don't get a working binary then. Um, but the advantage is it can be sometimes easier to write, uh, easier to write the proofs for. Uh, and the strategy is, is known as translation validation. I see. Okay, thank you. Thank you for your time. That, that, that was all.